I can't say, say how pleased I am, we are, this uh, clan of American climbers is, to be able to uh, spend a little time with, welcome, and thank a man who has been not just an inspiration to all of us for the way we approach the mountain environment, the way we approach adventure, the way we approach new routes, difficult terrain, but also the way we care for those places, the way we care for the people that live in those places, and the way we reinvent ourselves through the course of our lives to seek, adventure, express passion. And I'd like to present a little honor, a big thank you, and a great welcome to Reinhold Messner. Thank you. This is for you. Thanks. Yeah. I'll set it back here. Yeah. Fine. Can you say a few words? Yes. yes. Dear Fred, <laughs> back is here. Conrad is here. And many uh, other famous climbers. I think that uh, this is not the time to do a lecture in front of you. And since we are here in a, in a small group of climbers and uh, people very uh, interested in the mountains, I would uh, like to do a discussion with you. So. You are free to put in some questions. I am open to answer all the questions. And so we have to, um, an opportunity to decide by yourself how long we stay together. <laughs> <laughs> so who is interested to put in the first question about mountaineering, about um, wilderness, maybe preserved wilderness, doing some cultural work? You maybe know that uh, for me, Mountaineering or climbing is part activity and part also culture. We have a history, we have literature, we have a lot of artists, musicians, they, they worked in the mountains. And like the American Alpine Club, I'm bringing ahead a museum. They are also doing, I'm bringing, I bring ahead a, a library. You also do, that I'm very happy about. And I think, especially in the future, having now 90% of the climbers uh, staying indoor, uh, uh, training in the climbing walls, and they are right to do so. Uh, it's important they know that behind climbing there is a long history, at least 250 years in the modern times, thousands of years in the olden times, and this is part, at least in my view, of what we call traditional climbing or alpinism. Who is Keen enough to put in the first question. Conrad. <laughs> We're going to start out with a bang. A week ago, the compressor was <laughs> 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 so, Where is it possible, baby? So, are you aware of what happened a week ago? Yes, so, I know. Two young, talented climbers. One of them is the son of one of our esteemed members. Michael, are you in here? Michael, you Michael Kennedy is here. <laughs> Anyways, they, they pulled all the bolts on the way down. It's a huge, it's a huge debate. So, your thoughts on that, please? Historically, it's very interesting what happened. In the last years, a few people tried to free uh, the Maestri route, the second Maestri route, the first Maestri route in reality. This is another question uh, on the Cerro Torre. Afterwards, I tell a little bit about the Maestri stuff on on Cerro Torre, but. Uh, this second route, which he did in 70, 1970, on the end of his career, Maestro was a good Dolomite climber, he um, tackled up the south east ridge of Cerro Torre, putting in a lot of bolts. In reality, he went up with a machine and he put in a lot of bolts and he finally didn't reach the summit, but the last uh, rock base piece on Cerro Torre. 
especially last year and uh, the be, uh, year before, David Lama, a young, a young climber, which came out from the gym, tried to go there and he, they put again um, bolts in to do a show on Cerro Torre. And it was a big debate about this. And now finally, the son of Michael Kennedy did the ascent without uh, any bolts. And I'm very happy about because this man, this young man showed that Cerro Torre was possible, not 70, but now without using bolts. But the climbers were not willing to wait up to now when their, their abilities are so high that somebody could go up uh, without bolts. But the whole Cerro Torre story is much more important because in 59, when Cerro Torre uh, was climbed the first time, at least on the papers, by Ecker and Maestri, they were in competition, especially Maestri was in competition with Bonatti, and he was interested in Italy to show that he is able to do it. And Fava, Cesarino Fava, an Italian living in uh, Argentina, was interested to be a big climber, at least in his small climbing community. And so he pushed the story, which clearly was not possible. It was not possible in 59 with the equipment from 59, which we did not see in this fair here in, in uh, Salt Lake City. It was totally different equipment to go up the Cerro Torre route of 59 uh, to the summit. Uh, Cesare Maestri told in his writings that he put in 70 bolts on the east uh, north, north route of Cerro Torre, and nobody uh, found one of the bolts up to now. And is it not either possible to upsail from Cerro Torre on the way where they went down without using bolts? And we are quite sure now, I would not say the meters, that they went up to the ice triangle and not higher. What happens then, we don't know. Probably the tragedy went like he tells. But Cerro Torre was not uh, climbed in the 59. And only when Cesare Maestri came back from Cerro Torre uh, 70, from the route which was climbed now by Kennedy uh, in, in free style, I came in in the discussion, I was 25 years old, when Cesare Maestri told uh, openly in lectures in Italy, I went a second time to Cerro Torre to prove they, that I went up the first time. <laughs> and I answered, what you proved? You proved that, it, that you did not go up the first time because you went on another line and on a different style. If you like to prove that you went up on the first line, go on your first line and go maybe with young climbers, maybe with Kennedy of today, and let, let them lead, but show that you went up on this line because somewhere you found your old pitons. But he went on a different line, on a different style, and with the second ascent, he showed the, that the first ascent was a fake. Very simple. This is I did a book about it, it's not out in English, on the Cerro Torre story. There's a story, very interesting story. And the whole story was built up on the um, rivality between Bonatti and Maestri, especially in Italy. So next question, I'm very happy that um, Kennedy, the son of Kennedy, what is his name, the first Eddie. name? Eddie. Ed Eddie. 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 Adrian. Eddie. Eddie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First, when I heard that a Kennedy climbed this, uh, I was thinking Michael did it. But, uh, he's not anymore so young. But anyway, very happy and very, a good climb, very good climb. So, next question. Please. I've just uh, moved to a new school here, and we've been discussing a, a, a having an adventure and preservation based on things you've spoken about and get, are you know, about Gail and Raul, um, power with mountain cultures. Uh, you've spoken about leaving behind the horizontal oxygen warm. Gail and talk about how when that people who are adventurers, including yourself, became preservationists and connected cultures. Do you, would you have any advice? Would you be an advisor for actual uh, a university degree program? Do you think it's a good idea and uh, to put together ideas of adventure and preservation in 
uh, adventure, adventure and preservation. It's preservation, preservation yeah, but it's a quite difficult uh, issue. Because if we go in in an area, we are at least a risk for some destroying. And uh, the thing is quite simply uh, understandable if you know that wild uh, nature is only wild nature if we do not harm. So the first, of, the first important thing is we go in as single persons, also in 3-4, this is a single group, but not thousands. If thousand people are going on the Hillary route of Everest, this is not any more wilderness. This is a pista, like uh, skiing in uh, snowboard. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a big difference. I call the alpinism of today pista alpinism, because 90% of the climbers are following pistas uh, on difficult routes where they found um, some uh, bolts every two meters, so they have a line because you don't uh, either look for the line. If you go on, on a pista like on Everest normal way, not if you go on a different way on Everest, on, on the West Ridge, on the Southwest face, on the North face, there you are by yourself. So I would say to young people, if you like to go in to make experiences, strong personal experiences, go where nobody else is going. Don't leave any trucks your footprints, but the snow will, the wind will destroy them. And so um, wilderness is there forever. Preservation is quite easy if each one is going where the others are not going and leaving nothing. We are free to go everywhere, but we are not free to destroy the places where we make our experiences. Alpine style is one style. Alpine style is not, is not the style. And I would not either say that the, the way to go up in a commercial expedition on Everest is the wrong way. This is one possibility. And this is the possibility used especially today. Since thousands and thousands of climbers have the physical ability to climb Everest, why they should not go with a guide? If somebody would like to do something else, he's going on the East Face, like Stephen Venables, and find all the possibilities to exposure, expose him, expose himself to maximum. Uh, if you see the history of uh, Himalayan climbing, on the 8,000 meter climbing, it's quite easy to understand why the Himalayan style had to come in. For 55 years, nobody was able to climb an 8,000 meter peak. The, the most, uh, the strongest climbers of the world, think about Mallory, uh, Mamari, the first one, Mallory later on, um, Welzenbach. They tried on the 8,000 meter peaks. And for 55 years, nobody was able to do so. Why? Because they had not the equipment we had. They had very simple equipment. The knowledge was very small because only a few expeditions went every year. And uh, in 50, 1950, um, it became possible. The French were the best climbers in this period, so they came the first one to climb an 8,000 meter peak in 50, La Genale and Herzog. And between 15 years, all the 8,000 meter peak were climbed by national expeditions from America, Gashebrum won, from Japan, Manaslu, from Austria, Port Peak, Gashebrum II, and uh, Nangapabad. For nobody from Germany, it's very important. <laughs> it's very important. Uh, British climb uh, Everest, okay, but not British, or New Zealand, the Sherpa, they climbed Everest and they did Kanchenjunga. Uh, the French again did Makalu. Uh, the Swiss one, they climbed Lotse and Taulagiri. And I think I, the Italians climbed K2. So the classical mountaineering nations, they climbed these mountains. And these were all national expeditions. So the money came from the Alpine Club, from the American Alpine Club, from the Swiss Alpine Club, from the German Alpine Club. They did not summit, but uh, they, they financed some expeditions. And uh, this was a period when they used every equipment 
oxygen, whatever they could find, to go to the summit. In the 70s, if they would have a helicopter to climb up Everest, they would use the helicopter. <laughs> if um, the British and the Norwegians would have, have, had, have airplanes or helicopters, they would go to the South Pole by helicopters. But they had not this equipment, so they went with what they had. It was quite difficult. In after 64, when the Chinese, Chinese did the last 8,000 meter peak, I forgot them before, did Shisha Pangma, for four or five years, nobody was going to the 8,000 meter peaks. A few freaks, but they could not succeed. <laughs> A few Americans, they tried in four to go in and uh, tackle the, the border and go around and sneak into the Everest. They were very good, but they could not do it, because how you do it from, from Nepal all the way and, and so on. A few freaks tried, but nobody went, and there was no interest in the public. The 8,000 meter picks were done, and it was finished. And in 70, a new generation came, especially in Britain, and also in our places, which tried to do it in a different way. We did not go in 70 to climb uh, Annapurna South Face, which was done by Bonington and his crew, or to Nanga Papa South. Uh, we went to do the face, not anymore the normal way. The normal way was not it, uh, a little bit of interest in my generation. We were interested to do the big walls, like in the Alps, after the normal ways, became the period of the difficulties. This was the second period and, uh, of, of alpinism. And so uh, in the 70s, the, the good climbers, the ambitious climbers, they tried to do the most difficult routes, the big, big walls in the Himalayas. And after two, three of these experiences, I understood it will be also boring to use the expedition style, it means fixed ropes and camps and porters and maybe also oxygen to go up these difficult walls on these peaks. So I was thinking to do it in a small style. And this was the third period, which Mamari just used in the Alps, 1880. The, the first period of alpinism I call the alpinism of conquest, because the people went with the idea to conquest for the conquest of the summit. The second period is the period of the difficulties. They, they search for difficulties, so for the way. The way was the, the, the goal, not anymore the summit. The way to the summit, how difficult it was and how, how, how you could handle it. And the third period is the period of, of how, yeah, I'm in English, I don't know, in German it's Verzicht. Fred, help me, you are German, at least the half German. <laughs> Verzicht, what means verzicht? To, to, to leave apart most of the, uh, the thing you have at, at, at your disposal. From the 70s in, uh, afterwards, it was clear using all the equipment we would have at our disposal, we could go up everywhere. Today I can go on every summit of this world with the helicopter. This is a special helicopter, it's a question of money but not a question of ability. And with this was born the idea to put apart everything. In, case, in, in the perfect way, I go with a little bit of food, with a sleeping bag and maybe a tent, and I go without a rope, without a piton, without, uh, I need crampons and an ice axe maybe, but nothing more. And today I can go in blind in every mountain equipment store, and I take some equipment, an ice axe and jacket and trousers and shoes, and I can do all mountains of the world. But in the, in, in, in the 50s, you have to, had to be able to do your own constructions because in the, in, the, in the stores you did not find the right equipment. And in the meanwhile, there are so many climbers uh, interested in, in high places that thousands are going there. And the Sherpas made out a business of, that, of this. Why not? And they prepare the routes. And so they prepare a pista. And on this pista, this is a possibility for many people to go up to the summits. And for this, I call the climbing of today the pista alpinism. Very simple. But pista alpinism is tourism. What is tourism? Tourism is a, an activity where the organizer is preparing your stay in a way that is quite safe and secure. You don't like to make holidays in a hotel where maybe you die because 
uh, is poisoning or something like that. <laughs> so if you do your holidays, if you pay for your holidays, you like to have a secure way to skiing down or skiing up uh, with, with the ski lift, or to have a good pista to the summit. But alpinism, classical, traditional alpinism, is beginning where tourism is finishing. And if tourism reached the summit of Mount Everest, where alpinism is beginning, on smaller mountains and on unknown places, very simply. And there is a lot of historical stuff. And I like it if young people are going to study and to f follow the historical questions, the big questions. Mallory reached the summit or not, Conrad Anker went and he tried to do the second summit with the ladder, without the ladder, and he gave some answers. Now, uh, Kennedy, uh, Kennedy's son, went up uh, Cerro Torre uh, without using the bolts, and he showed it would be possible also without this big machinery. And it's very interesting. From the historical side, we have many things to tell, and from the psychological side, everything is to retell. What do you think about the removal of the bolts? Should they stay for a point in history, or is it doing more damage than good, or is it just the way it... Uh, somebody put in these bolts, and he didn't ask anybody. <laughs> and if tomorrow a young climber is putting them all out, I will clap. <laughs> I want to thank you. This was wonderful. I want to give you people some, some time to meet Reinhold if you haven't. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, and I also want to thank Adidas Outdoors for bringing you over here and making this possible. You've, no you've been wonderful.